Paul said, I have my countryside broadband hat on now. So the first thing about us is, um, well, sort of who are we, really? Our base is in uh, the small village of Woodcote in South Oxfordshire. It's a pretty place, very typical English village, and we've been running our uh, internet service provision using wireless technology for more than 10 years. Our primary delivery technology is radio systems operating now in the 5.8 gigahertz band, which is very clear line of sight requirement between the radio points for connection. Woodcut's on a hill, which is very convenient for us because on top of the hill there's a communications mast, and you can see that uh, in the picture there, which is taken outside of my house looking up the road to the top of the hill. It's a hell of a mast. It's about 35 metres at the top. I've been up there a few times. It is a stupendous view. That looks, that's looking from the top to the north over the village and out into the surrounding area. So it's great for line of sight sort of stuff. Wonderful. It was one of the primary considerations for actually starting the business at all in the first place in 2003. Now, not long after we started the service, we were approached by the management committee for a prestige housing development uh, in the parkland surrounding a large Victorian mansion. There it is. Quite a nice place. The surrounding parkland has various other houses. This is part of the old walled garden, which has been converted in, into apartments. Um, other apartments have been built in the grounds and surrounding it all. It's quite a nice place. But the, uh, the DSL telephone service there at the time, this is 2004 we're talking, so it's quite a while ago, was pretty poor. And when I say pretty poor, I mean there were places on the estate where you could just about get 300 kilobits a second. Now, even in 2004, that wasn't much of a laugh. We thought, well, maybe we can do this with wireless. Perhaps um, we can see into the estate, which is only about four kilometres away from the tower in Woodcote. But that's not the case. The estate has lots and lots of trees all around it. Um, so we really couldn't see anything getting into there. Uh, and we couldn't see how we could get around there, even if we did. However, due to planning restrictions when the estate was, was uh, developed, there were no antennae or satellite dishes allowed to be installed on any of the houses. The developer had to put in a satellite and TV distribution system. Let me turn the right page over here. Okay. Um, to do that, they had to put up a mast in the grounds. There it is. Uh, it's in a, a technical compound which has various other utility functions taking place in it. There's a pump house in there. In the pump house, there's a, a satellite and TV distribution head end. It's Recaro, for those who are interested in whose kit it is. Uh, it's had a few tweaks and mods over the years, and you can see it's normal sort of nearly tidy arrangement that most head ends are. Rye grins around the room, I see. <laughs> so we thought, okay, well, if we could get to the tower, maybe we could put the broadband on the satellite distribution system using conventional cable TV technology at the time. So let's have a look at the diagrams. So we got the diagrams out. In fact, we went to get the diagrams out before, of course, there weren't any diagrams. So we had to go and survey the thing. And here we have the diagram of the whole system as it is. It's not exactly the way it was on the day that we started, but it's a close enough representation of how it is now. There's a little head end here, which is the, the, the previous photograph. And then there's a cascaded amplifier system, which uh, carries the cables around the place. Now, this is a classic five wire satellite systems. There are five cables running around the estate. At each cabinet, there is an amplifier regeneration set of five amplifiers. That's one for each of the four satellite multiplexes, which I will explain a wee bit more about later on. And one for essentially the terrestrial service. And that's what was interesting to me because the terrestrial service bit looks very much like a conventional cable TV system. The, um, the cabinets themselves have multi-switches in them. And each multi-switch serves nominally around about 12 homes. Some are more, some are less. There's some fours and there's some 24s. But 12 is a sort of working average, that's about right. Looking at the terrestrial amplifiers in this cascaded thing, they were very much like cable TV amplifiers. They were 860 meg. Uh, they had uh, a 5 to 65 reverse path diplexers in them. Mostly they had active amplifiers in them, though they weren't commissioned. Uh, and, and so forth. So it all looked like it might just be capable of doing what we wanted to do. With a bit of ingenuity, we could probably add a broadband DOCSIS system to it. So a couple of look around. So we've got, uh, there's a cabinet. You can see it's got five amplifiers in it. Um, the the, the wideband satellite amplifiers are from 950 to 2.4 gigs. 
I have terrifying gain of 52 dBs in the worst configuration. Uh, and the amplifier on the bottom left-hand corner is a conventional cable TV one, but they all look much the same. Those were Philips amplifiers at the time, long departed, but uh, very classic in terms of how they were laid out. Not terribly modern technology by today's um, standards in terms of their amplifier technology inside. But nevertheless, nothing wrong with them at all. Nice, solid devices. In the lid of them, there's a multi-switch. Move it a bit closer. That's a classic multi-switch. It's got five inputs on the upper side coming in with the little white tacky label stuck to them. And in this case, it's got eight outputs running on the edge, which run off to eight different homes surrounding the cabinet with conventional drop cables laid in underground ducts. Drop cables, you can see there, are sort of RG11 in size. The trunk cables that run around the estate are much bigger. Can't really see them in this cabinet terribly well because the, the cabinet that I've taken this for a different reason. But the trunk cables are about 15, 16 millimetres in diameter and very low loss because this is a long system. This is about 1.3 kilometres long from head end to last cabinet. This cabinet is one which has been a source of endless aggravation. We zoom into the bottom there. You'll see that's the ant's nest that lives in this cabinet. That ant's nest and us have had a long running battle. <laughs> they generally win. You can see the white powder in there, that's ant powder. Now that's a regular visit. But every six months go in there, scatter the ant powder around to see if you can kill off the ants. You get rid of most of them, but the buggers keep coming back. And the real problem with ants for us anyway is the ants bring moisture into the cabinets. The cabinets become very humid inside and humid and electronics just don't get on terribly well. But it's, it's an endless war of attrition. I think it always will be. Uh, we, 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 you know, the, if the cabinets had gas seals on the ducts and the cabinets had great gas seals around the ground level, that might be the case, but they don't. So, mention the multi-switches. There's a quick diagram just to give a, a crude example of why they work, just for those who aren't familiar with this type of technology. I know there's quite a few people in the room who aren't, but I equally know there's a few people in the room who are, are not. Satellite bands coming down from the uh, satellite, in this case it's the Astra satellite, come down in the KU band. The KU band is from 10.7 to 12.75 gigahertz. And they use both the vertical and the horizontal polarizations in order to double the capacity on the downlinks. These are converted in the satellite dish LNB, the low noise block down converter, um, into a more usable frequency set, which runs in the 950 to 2.4 megahertz. Uh, range for carriage around the network, hence the need for all the high gain. Now this satellite band is therefore about 1450 megahertz wide and at the time when all this game kicked off that was too wide for the tuners in the satellite receivers. They couldn't span that range. So the trick was to subdivide both the horizontal and the vertical into an upper and lower section. So you had four cables running around the system then you use a multi-switch, which is driven by the satellite receiver using the DISEC protocol in order to decide which one of the four incoming signal sets you wanted. The program identifier data, which is carried within the channel, says allows the satellite receiver then to say, I've now got, for example, the horizontal high slice, and within the horizontal high slice, I navigate my way to this multiplex, and within this multiplex, I select this program. It sounds complicated, and it is. But it's been around for a long, long time, and it works pretty well. So here I've, I've given a very crude representation of a, a switch controller and a sort of commutating switch here, which can select from the four inputs that it wants. And then it goes to an outplex diplex combiner, which puts the signal onto the cable going down to the home. The DISEC commands actually consist of two DC voltages, 13 volts or 18 volts, and an absence or presence of a 22 kilohertz tone. That gives you four switching conditions and allows you to select which one of the four inputs you want. It means, of course, the drop cable's got to carry DC. The stuff I am interested in is the terrestrial inputs. Now, the terrestrial inputs come in, basically come into, in this case, a two-way splitter. It steers its way around all this fancy switching stuff and then gets combined back into the drop cable using a diplex combiner of the output. So, for all practical purposes, from the cable T perspective, this is a two-way splitter. And all of the other multi-switches are, whether they be two-way, four-way, eight-way, twelve-way, look like N-way splitters. That is not universally absolutely true for all manufacturers of multi-switches, but it is for the vast majority and has become more so in recent years than less so. In some of them, the more fancy ones, you find they've got a forward path amplifier. Um, and some of them have got a passive reverse path in the 5 to 65 big band. Some haven't. 
So in our particular case, we went around and researched them all. We went to the site of the manufacturer, spoke to them. And after a good deal of deliberation, we came to the conclusion, actually, yes, the thing would function like a conventional cable TV system, from our point of view, as to whether we could. This is still investigation time. Make it work. So we did the analysis of the forward path at 300 megahertz. Now, of course, the nice thing about this cable TV system, it's got sort of all cat channels on it. It's got the downstream analog channels at the time, no digital TV, FM radio. There's acres of space in the spectrum to carry a carry down there. And we looked at the reverse path at 20 megs in the middle of the band for no good reason. Uh, and, and, and did the analysis. We, we looked at the reverse path in quite a bit because although the... Um, the trunk cables and the most of the drop cables were pretty good quality. Once you get into the home, then the quality of the cables was way outside of our control. And some of the cables in the home, the drop cables in the home, were actually video cables. No tape screens on, on, on the car access at all. And consequently, we were really right concerned about the level of reverse path noise ingress coming in from the homes, which we would be unable to control. So we worked our proposition out on the basis we would crank up the CMTS input demand to 10 dBmV, which is higher than the zero actually what it asked for in the first place, in order to make the reverse path carrier signals climb above the noise floor by a reasonable degree to make it work. All of that, we did our analysis. Okay, so it might work. Now, at the time, there was available a Eurodoxis 1.1 um, pizza box CMTS from uh, Daphne, a Belgian manufacturer, still in existence today, which came with um, all the toys you need to make it work. So it came with an integrated RFUP converter, it came with a DHCP server, it came with a simple customer administration system, all in one box. And we did the maths, and after a lot of uh, thinking about it, we thought, well, we explore it into a, a feasible model. So would we make it pay? Well, there were 68 homes, and the management committee were saying that it's a done deal. You will be overwhelmed by demand. Everyone's going to want the broadband when you come along. Silly thing to believe that was, but there we go. We knew from our existing wireless network that we were running that we yielded a bottom line contribution of about five pounds per customer. That's going, that's after all overheads, utilities, everything you can think of, we got about five quid a month per customer of bottom line contribution into the pot. So, with perhaps rather more engineering enthusiasm than financial common sense, we went ahead and spent some money. There it is. £7,250 in round terms on kit to go and put it in. That was everything we could think of we might need to need, including the radio link from Woodcut to the tower in the compound I showed you earlier on. And off we went. Started connecting customers. We reckoned that with 40 customers, we should get our money back in three or four years. Seemed reasonable enough. Demand was good. Very unlikely that much was going to happen, according to BT at the time. They were never going to do anything else in the way of upgrading the systems around there. They're far too far from the exchange. And we think, great, that'll do. Equipment should last seven or eight years with a bit of luck. Shouldn't be too difficult to maintain. It's a nice, simple little system. We should make some money. However, the initial take-up was much lower than we expected. We got a little rush at the beginning. We got a sort of 20 or so relatively quickly, but after that, it was a one at a time trickle in. And this experience has been repeated for us as a company and as a warning lesson for anyone else who wants to get into small scale broadband operations. I suspect large scale broadband operations too. Whenever a group of people tell you they are desperate for the service and everyone's going to sign up, it isn't true. It just isn't true. It doesn't happen, yeah? except in very rare occasions. Um, and we have found this again and again. It actually took us five years to get the 40 customers we want, which, of course, is beyond the full time we expected to get our money back. So, funnily enough, we hadn't got our money back by then. And we did find we had a lot of reverse path issues. Now, the reverse path issues took some time to bottom out, and they were all craft issues with the connectors on the big, fat cables. Um, they are particularly difficult to strip and prepare, and it took us a while to master that, and the problems tended to be seasonal. Nothing would go wrong in the summer. And then come the autumn, it gets cold and miserable and rotten to work outside in. Then you'd find the reverse path would suddenly it would find attenuation leaps of 10 or 15 dBs would pop up one day and they'd disappear tomorrow. Someone would kick a cabinet or whatever else and they'd vanish. And they were damn difficult to find. But then 
That's the way things are, isn't it, really? We learnt, from, we learnt from our lessons and we eventually got over the issues. We worked quite hard for quite a long time. And having got through that lot, we thought that's really it. Well, then we discovered one or two other little things came along. We had a nice cabinet in the woods with all our CMTS and other kit in it. And when we got the first really cold winter, we discovered our equipment didn't like going down to zero degrees. So we had to put a heater in there. All right, not a big deal, a heater. It's a greenhouse heater with a thermostat. Of course, then in the summer, we had a nice hot summer, then they got too hot in the cabin, so put fans in there as well. So we had to create what effectively was a mini head-end environment inside the street cabinet. We actually put all the kit in. Hindsight's a wonderful thing. We should have known all this at the beginning. Nevertheless, we fought our way through it, and it settled down. The customers became happy, and so did we. Time passed. What else have I got here? Yeah, the actual payback turned out to be about seven years. Now, of course, if we'd known that at the time, it was going to be seven years worth of some pain and a long time, we might not have bothered to do it at all. But then, like I said, hindsight's a wonderful thing. Time moved along. In 2009, we upgraded the whole of the radio system. Our radio system prior to that was operating in the 2.4 gigahertz band. It was becoming cluttered, full of other people occupying it, and the capacity we had in the radio system we had was just not enough to cope with the demand. And we moved into the 5.8 gigahertz band. And that was great. That was just what we did, really, because sometime around about that time, we started to see rectangular blocks of traffic appearing. 1.5 megabits or so lasting for half an hour, or lasting an hour. This was the arrival of iPlayer and other video streaming stuff. And that had a noticeable effect on how things were going to work. So we were in that the 4 megabit service we were then offering was not going to be enough. We would have to do something about that. Well, we were well underneath the uh, ceiling of the CMTS, which would do 38 megabits a second. Peak payload spread across all the customers. We were nowhere near that number in terms of the gross throughput chart, so I've got one or two, I'll show you it later on. So we thought, well, we'll, uh, we'll have to do something about this. Um, we'll, uh, we'll go up to 10. Decent sized jump. Yeah. Systems should still cope with it. It should all work nicely. And the other thing that prompted us was that around about that time, the DSL service moved from plain DSL to DSL2. And the 600 kilobits that people were getting was getting up to more like three. So they were snapping at our heels, so we moved it all up. Funnily enough, when we made the jump to 10, we thought we might see a lot of people suddenly use 10. But we didn't. We've seen this effect again later on, where we pushed the ceiling up, expecting traffic to traffic, and it didn't. An awful lot of people didn't even notice. Curious, that. However, we could see as time went along that by the time we got to 2012, we were starting to see the point in time when we might find we were going to run out of steam with our 38 megabit gross traffic capability on the network and we would need to do something about it. Well, we had two options, really, in 2012. Remember, we passed the point where we got our money back. It's not quite so bruising as it used to be. It's fun from time to time. So we could take the, well, boys, it's been fun while it lasted, but cut it off. Yeah, the business has run its course. There's no point in carrying on anymore because we just haven't got the heart to carry on. We didn't make that decision. The other one was to think, well, should we upgrade the system? Should we go for something better or faster in order to keep up with the customer's demand and take us out another jump into the future by a worthwhile number of years? So we thought, well, we'll have a look around and see what we've got in the way of options. Now, there were three options we decided to look at. New CMTS with its multiple upstream and downstream channel configuration. A couple of alternate technologies, the uh, Multimedia Ever Coax Alliance Mocha equipment. Uh, this uses frequency bands, bi-directional frequency bands, between 500 and 1500 megahertz. There's quite a raster of them. If you go online and look it up, it's quite an interesting little piece of technology. It's really well suited to in-home passive distribution systems. It copes with huge dynamic losses between the points of delivery. Or to look at uh, Ethernet of a coax, which operates in the frequency band, for one we were interested in anyway, between 7.5 and 67.5 megahertz. This is a technology much like the power line technology used by home plug-in devices like that, which allow you to send uh, broadband signals around the cabling in your house. 
So we had a look. So first, CMTS. Now this is all fairly conventional picture. I imagine most people will be familiar with what I'm doing here. We've got our frequency band with the forward and reverse paths in it. The orange carrier represents the existing carriers. We can add more carriers up and downstream, plenty of space in the spectrum to do that. We could run the two systems we wanted to at the same time. Of course, there's a complete hardware change to do it, but because you could run both systems at the same time, you could do it iteratively, literally customer by customer. And we can increase the bandwidth pool that they're all effectively swimming in to several hundred megahertz, so several hundred megabits per second, which would seem to be plenty for what we were doing at the time. Lots of spare spectrum. There we go. Okay. Marker. Now, this was fine. Multiple channels are available. They're all above 85 megahertz. And that was um, a bit of a problem because... Um, if they're using a transmit and receive carrier in 500 megahertz, you can't have a one-way amplifier in the downstream path. Your downstream path has to be bidirectional. In other words, it just has to be a path, a passive path. So unfortunately, it, despite path loss and the huge capacity, Mocha 2.5 come out as 2.5 gigs trans transmission technology, which around home would be fabulous. So since the same transmit frequency we computed, it was not compatible with the system without the fires. So we moved on to the third one we were looking at, which is the Ethernet over coax system. Now again, here we have a different thing. This has uh, a wide RFDM carrier set operating in the band, in this case it's actually from 7.5 to 67.5, which maps pretty well onto a system with a 5 to 65 meg a lower band. It's bidirectional in the same band, so maybe the same problem we had with Mocker exists there. Same transmit and receive frequencies. Coats with high path loss is somewhere between 15 and 16 dBs. That's the operating window. It operates outside of 60, we know that from our own testing. But full speed operates um, in there. The carriers are uh, independently modulated up to 4096 QAM. It's a dynamic process which adapts itself <coughs> continuously to the conditions of the circuit in which the traffic is being carried. It's quite a complex error collection. And the line speed you can achieve, the line speed, I use that word deliberately, not necessarily the speed you offer the customer, the line speed is up to 700 megabits per second. We've tested that and we know it's true. So that's all very well, but could we make it work? Well, you could have more endpoints we needed. We've got 68 homes. We're never going to get 68 customers, but that's more, way more than we would need. Could we make it work? Well... Here's a classic amplifier. I know it's a very simple diagram, but it just shows a conventional amplifier in its essence. Forward amplifier, reverse amplifier, the paths segregated by diplex filters to manage the upstream and downstream traffic and to stop the whole thing going to uncontrollable oscillation. So if we look at that and take the reverse amplifier out and put a passive link into it, then the 5 to 60 megahertz band becomes bidirectional, which does make it compatible with our aspirations for Ethernet over coax. So, bearing in mind the 15 to 60 dB loss, could we make it work? So, let's go back to the diagram. There's the diagram we had before. We've got the, we put in our broadband master unit up in the top right-hand corner. I've added in some yellow block components to show the bypass filters, and I worked out an approximate loss for the links, and we hunted around to find the most lossy place. There it is, 57.3 dBs to cabinet number five in Hawthorne Drive. That's the worst case. Now that falls inside the 60 dB window. And that's the bi-directional loss at 65 megahertz. Because the nice thing about this, you can calculate in one direction, it's the same in the other. So it would work. Well, all right, it will work. So we've now got either works, Doxis or EOC works. How much bandwidth do we actually need, and does it pay? So now we've got the point where, stepping back from the engineering excitement of finding a solution that might work, yes, actually we're going to make any money out of it. So, a few graphs here. This is a graph from uh, 2013 for Mr. I. Uh, probably two people in the room may know who Mr. I is. I have his permission to use this graph. I've scaled the graph up to 25 megabits, even though at the time I would only scaled it to 10, but because I want to draw a contrast with the ones that are going to follow it. I've chosen a week in April, for no good reason other than I threw a dart at the calendar to pick a week in April. 
and then use the same week for the following graphs. And you can see now that week they downloaded 29 gigabytes worth of data and uploaded three. A year later, it's jumped a bit. Now, you see here, he's just about reaching his 10 megabit per second ceiling, but not very often, and he doesn't notice it. He's got about twice the download and a lot more upload. Jump forward another two years, that's funny. We've now implemented a higher throughput rate on the system. He still hasn't noticed, um, but his traffic demand's gone down. Now, what this illustrates for us is that the supposedly inexorable rise of people's demand doesn't appear to exist for us. People go up and then they change and they go down again and they go up and down again. It, it seems to reach some position where their consumption goes up and down according to what they're actually doing. <coughs> this is the gross throughput on the whole system. Now, you can see here, again, I've got, I've got 60 megs as the top scale here because I need that when we get further down the page. So at that time in April, we had 29 gigabytes for Mr. I and 123 for the whole system. He was eating 10% of the system's capacity, one customer. I told you he was the busiest customer. This is a guy who works from home. His wife also works from home part-time. Two adult children, both living and working and living at home. Busy place. A year later, well, that's jumped a bit, isn't it? Now the system is going up to 20 megabits. This is when we're beginning to think, Lord, we need to worry about, this is where we're going to worry about running out of steam here, when we start to think about it in 2012. Here we are today. Now we've already made our transition to the new technology by this time, and you can see this is one week, 882 gigabytes. That's a lot of stuff in a week. And the upload, well, the upload has not really gone up in ratio very much more than it has before but a lot of traffic. Now, we have graphs, graphs like this going back 10 years, so great, you can really play with the data to see what's going on. And we have customers going through that period of time too. There's lots of continuity in that data. A challenge has arisen here. Mr. D has just bought himself an Ultra HD TV set. It's a big thing. He wanted to know whether or not he could run Netflix 4K movies on it because the guys at Netflix says he needs 25 megabits a second to do it. Well, here you can see a couple of Netflix sessions, and they're running around the 15 megabits per second mark. And that's a challenge that's going to start to occur for us. It hasn't really occurred much yet. But speaking to him, he says it's quite a production, actually deciding to sit and watch such a thing. It, it's, you, have to sort of, you can't sort of casually watch EastEnders on, on that sort of scale. It doesn't really fit into his viewing aspirations. And finally... This is the gross traffic across our whole system for a year. Forgive the gap in the middle at the, at the, in, in Christmas time. We had a hardware failure. We have a number of status monitoring systems all running at the same time in parallel. I run one in my office at home. Bill over there runs one in his. And we have one running in the system at the tower. The system at the tower fell over at Christmas time. Since we were monitoring the others to get all the alarms off it, we didn't go fix it straight away lazy people we are at Christmas time. So, in a year, 138 terabytes worth of data. That's a lot of stuff. And I put a trend line on that, and the trend line illustrates something I have a hypothesis about but no proof of. And that is that our data consumption on a per customer basis is starting to saturate. And I don't think it's saturating because of the technology. I think it's saturating because of the people's ability to consume there are only 24 hours in the day. There are only seven days in the week. There's only so much time that people will sit in front of a screen doing what they do in front of the screen. Now, I, I've no more than a, a, this is something I instinctively believe, but I can't prove it. Give me another two years, maybe I can. Because looking at that, I'm thinking, well, does this mean that we are going to see our demand for data, which we have to provide our customers, endlessly climbing? Will the current 25 megs we offer need to be 50 megs next year? Will it be 100 megs a year after? I don't really believe that it will. In fact, when we jumped from 10 megabits per second to 25 on the estate, which we did earlier this year, um, and we did it because people were saying, well, we want to sell our house, and we'd like to say we've got super fast broadband, and 10 megas isn't super fast broadband. And Bill and I agonised over this for quite some time, saying, well, if we just push the limit up to 25, would anybody notice? Because our traffic graph said they wouldn't. And so we did push the up to 25, and nobody noticed. We left it up there for six weeks, and nobody noticed. Then we told them we'd moved it up, and one or two people, they did stuff to test it. They said, oh, yeah, it is 25. 
And we do sell 25, we don't sell up to. Yeah, we think that honesty is quite an important thing with the customer. So if we say you are getting a 25 megabit service, we're not saying you get 25 megabits forever. So that you will see 25 megabits a second on the service on a fairly regular basis, except at really peak busy hours. It will be there. So, both systems work, as far as we're concerned. They have the capacity, certainly we could run up into the 300 megabits per second rate if we wanted to. Lord alone knows why. I mean, no, no one in, the, in, our, in our universe has got a router which will do more than about 80 megabits a second on its, on its hardwired ports, let alone the, the, the performance on the wireless parts of it, which are considerably less. So we think we've, we're pretty safe for quite a long way out. The status monitoring and the uh, management committee of both systems was really, well, how user-friendly are they? Well, the, um, the doctor system is basically a new version of what we've had before. Um, Daphne, now called Damery, and there are other people in the marketplace selling pizza bots, single integrated CMTS systems, more expensive than they were. But you know that beast, and we've learned most of the wrinkles. And there were a few wrinkles to learn. So that would be quite easy for us to make that transition. The EAC, we had a long, long, hard look at this. Now, I can't get away from the fact that it's a clunkier thing to manage. And, and it took a deal of thinking, and I don't claim any credit for that because my colleague Bill Petty over there is much better at this than I am, as to how we could use our core router, which sits in the middle of our network, to actually manage the aspects of traffic control in terms of speed rating. And that turned out to be something which our router, which is not a huge, vast, expensive device, it's vast called a fiber, it's quite capable of doing, so we've actually rate limit customers at the core. And that's turned out to be extremely successful and not too difficult to do once you learn the wrinkle. Like many things we discovered, we were ahead of the game in terms of learning how that particular wrinkle functioned. We, our supplier said, yep, you can do it, and we had to figure out how. So the last thing, does it pay? Well, funnily enough, our margins haven't really changed very much. We still make about five pounds per customer, despite the fact that data rates are climbed through the ceiling and data costs have come down, but funnily enough, it's still about five quid per customer per month. So there's a little comparison. If we looked at Doxys 3.n, it would have been 3.0 at the time, CMTS. And we looked at the payback. Well, it was quite easy in terms of the payback question. In other words, we were looking at 35 months, in other words, three and a half years, or three years, for the Doxis version, and 19 months, rather less than two years, for the EOC. Now, our experience said, that, OK, that's fair enough. On the basis of cost, where are you? There we go. EOC would get our vote because there was a shorter payback with less risk. And for us performance, this has got an interesting. Because you link out, actually take out all the reverse wife amplifiers, the network becomes entirely passive from head end to home. There's nothing in that link at all which is active. Because you've got no amplifier, reverse amplifiers, then of course the power consumption comes down. And because it's only passive, it must be intrinsically more reliable. So, what else do we have to consider? Well, either solution will cast some parallel running one way or another. The Doxis upgrade, really, that is quite simple. There's, there's no real change to the existing plant. Where have you gone? I'm not pressing the clicker in the right place. Oh, there it is. There's no change to the existing plant. The customers can be swapped out one by one, and that's, that's, a, that's a nice thing to do. Now, if you've got 1,000 customers to change out and you want to try and change them out on a, as we had to, a cabinet by cabinet basis, that requires some organisation. So it is more complicated, the upgrade for that. Now, of course, remember, there are five coax cables running around this estate, as there are in most MATV systems of the coax design. So actually what we could do is we could use one of those satellite cables to temporarily carry all the Ethernet for coax traffic. So we could physically run it in parallel on, on one of the other cables, because those other cables are running from 950 to 2.4 gigs in terms of of bandwidth occupation, there's nothing at the bottom end. So it wasn't too difficult to say, well, we could get some diplex filters, you know, single block F connector type diplex filters, and put strap links around the satellite amplifiers to make that circuit intact. So we could run the two in parallel. We still had to do it on a cabinet by cabinet basis, but remember, we've only got 
12 people per home, and we haven't got 12 customers in every cabinet. We're, our penetration's about 70%, which is wonderful, but it isn't 100%. And by a fair amount of work, bringing people around, finding who was home, blah, 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 we found that we could do it, and in fact we did. So that made the decision for certain. There was quite a lot of stuff in that. Whoops, back one. In the, uh, the network swap, it went without any grey hitch. It took us about a week to do. All the issues we did find, however, were in the home. In the old system, we had a downstream carrier at 300 megahertz coming into the home, upstream carrier at 20 megahertz. Mostly we put the cable modem in the cupboard under the stairs where the drop cable came in, where you get on the end of the drop cable. Far and away the best place to do it. But sometimes you couldn't. Sometimes the cable came up in the lounge where there'd be a tripex plate on the wall with TV, FM and, and satellite out on it. A lot of those actually were bi-directional in the sense that they were OK out of the TV port at 300 and OK into the TV port at 20 megs. An awful lot of them were that we had to do. There weren't a huge number, but a dozen or so. However, when we came to try and squirt the whole 5 to 65 megahertz band within their upstream, we discovered some of those face plates were just not up to it. Some of them would be good for 25 megs wide. You'd know which 25 megs it was and so forth. So we had to do a bit of fiddling about there. And that meant doing research in the marketplace for faceplates that would be suitable. And such things do exist. Much to my surprise, I thought we were going to have to get quite ingenious there. Turns out that a couple of manufacturers, no sales claim here, but Triax for one, they make a special Irish version of their faceplate, which is used by UPC in Dublin. And it carries the 5 to 65 meg reverse path. Now, no one from Triax in the room, and I have no idea why they do it, but you know, there they existed. And so we found we had to carry a little stock of those around for the few places we had to do it. All the other in-home issues we have are hashes, issues we had to start with, which are about in-home propagation. And that's mostly got to do with how people carry stuff around their homes in the wireless. You go in with a new service, you say, here you are. So it's a yeah, new service is running at 25 megs. And they say, yeah, but I've got my iPad out here, and I'm getting three. And then you go through all the usual stuff on how you're connected. Well, I've got my wireless router in the cupboard over there under the stairs, and I've got all this metal stuff around it, and, and the, the connectivity is terrible, and so forth, which hadn't been revealed in the earlier versions of the, of, the, of the speed we were offering. But when we pushed the speed limit out, they couldn't get it. All the cable otters in this room who've been around this loop will know how impenetrable this can be. It's a matter of patient one by one knocking them down, and, and it's, it's hard work. And it's probably a subject for quite a long paper at some point, I would think. So, this is a worked up example. I did, I, this is similar to the table I showed before. This is one I put up just so someone who might just be thinking, well, might as well have a crack at this. We've got an apartment block sitting on the edge of uh, town somewhere where we can get a, a service from a major network provider, Virgin Media, for example, British Telecom. Perhaps we should see if we can't make this work in our apartment block because the telephone cabling running around the apartment has been in the apartment walls for 50 years. We can't get at it and the DSL service in the building is dreadful. That is the uh, rough breakdown that I drew up as a worked example. If someone's look at this table, they can criticise it in quite a few ways, but the critical things in this table are two numbers. That one there, which is the tariff for a 50 megabit business grade circuit, which from the graph I've shown about our gross traffic on our little cable network would easily satisfy the need for now and for two or three years probably, and how much you can get them to pay. That shows that you've still got to charge quite a fair amount of money for the service to make it work. Where's the thing? There we go, there we are. Um, but if you can make that work, and you can mess about with these numbers, there are people who will make that number 500 go down to zero. I mean, if, for example, you were a virgin media man and you wanted to wire up an apartment block on the edge of your network, you could probably make that number disappear altogether. And you can then charge much less money. But it does work. Because largely the TV system will be extant, it will already exist. You don't have to rewire it all by vast amounts. I'd probably get shot at for several reasons on that, but I thought I'd put that up all the same. So, moving on. Conclusions. Well, as far as we're concerned, this technology works well. It's done exactly what it said on the tin, albeit it took us a little while to get the lid off. It can be compatible with almost any classic SMAT v kayak system with very little modification. It would suit existing, I'm not sure about hotels, but certainly apartment and housing complexes and other distributed schemes, estates like the one we're on, which are, which are, which are in need of something, and they've got an existing SMAP system, which, which is, is uh, sitting there with this effectively unused chunk of capability built into it. It 
does need a good quality interconnection. If all the things that we've talked to people about who've said, can they copy our little organise our operation elsewhere in other villages around the first few days, you've got to get it back all right. If you can't get it back all right, then you're wasting your time. Of course, it's suitable. It's a slightly tongue-in-cheek statement I'm making here, but I'm conscious of it, that if you have a HFC cable network with small loads in it, and funny enough, an awful lot of us do, then um, it's about a tenth of the cost the master unit is of a CMTS. You then have to upgrade the amplifier plant. In fact, you have to downgrade the amplifier plant. You have to take all the reverse amplifiers out. <laughs> so none of this, you don't have to change the bandwidth configuration at all. You have to make it better. The power consumption goes down, and the network's more reliable. Draw your own conclusions, gentlemen. So thanks for listening. A few words of thanks. Thank uh, two people for proofreading it before I actually let it out. Bill Petty, my colleague over there. Is Dave in the room? Dave Wallard here today? No, he's not with us. Well, Dave read it as well. And also I need to thank Jeff Bray from Segnet, who kindly lent us a lot of equipment for test and evaluation, and we'll definitely pay for it one day, Jeff. <laughs> so I'll leave you with this final thought. The power's gone. You're on our system, you've got a UPS you've plugged your endpoint modem into, and your wireless router. The battery's in the cabinet are holding the system up for four hours, and you could be browsing by candlelight. I thank you. Uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, oh, absolutely entertaining. Um, I've got a few minutes for questions, if there are any, but um, if not, um, one at the back, please. Hi, Mike. Um, how do you get around the fact that you're actually operating it on somebody else's system? You've got a TV system, probably. Yeah. And then you're, you're working on this. Well, we, we were invited by the system owner to do it. We, we didn't go in there stone cold and say, can we do it? <laughs> they, they asked us in. So, um, yeah, if, if, so I'm, if you're a maintenance company that maintains a SMAPV system in a residential apartment block, say, yeah, then there's an opportunity here where you can say to the management committee, yeah, I can help you out with better broadband in your building. Yeah. You can't sort of march in and say, right, I want the rights of access. That, that wouldn't work at all. Is that the answer you want to? Yeah. Any more? Yes, John. It was much fun, John. Any more? Yes, Roger. Um, just a question about uh, the asymmetric nature of the service. Uh, in terms of uh, downstream, I can see that uh, there is a trend uh, upwards. Uh, I find with my service, which is BT and minimal, the, it's the reverse path that actually kills me all the time. Well, we, we've, we've always tended to make the reverse path larger than, than the competing services as a ratio is concerned. Yeah, our 20, it's 25 down and 5 up we run at the moment. And the 5 up really is an, is an empirical figure we, we derive by looking at what's going on. Because the, the OFDM nature of the, of the transmission path we have is it is intrinsically symmetrical. Um, because it's same band operation in each direction, uh, it's, uh, for those who used to know it, it's called simplex or it's half duplex, if you like. It means that the 700 megabits apparent line speed, you could say, well, actually, really, it's 350 megs in each direction if you want to make it symmetrical. But, but it's so asymmetrical anyway, it doesn't matter. But, but we, so we tend to watch the reverse path usage. And if we see people starting to bang their head on the ceiling, the reverse path, then it makes good sense for us to push that ceiling up for two reasons. First of all, it's good for our reputation. But secondly, if people start to saturate the reverse path, it impinges on the downstream transmission characteristics of the network because the network gets involved in multiple upstream retries on the, on the packet protocols that are running, and that consumes processor overhead in the various devices along the way, which can mean that the downstream speed then appears to suffer. So you watch that. Um, but at the current configuration, 25 down and 5 up, it's, it, it, it doesn't happen. We have got one or two customers who've asked for more, and we've, we've basically wound the wick up. But it's, it's not a generic thing. We thought it might become so a couple of years ago, but it, it seemed that for a while it was rising rapidly, but not anymore. Uh, you, you mentioned hotels. 
quite a few I've been in lately, and I usually test the speed when I'm there, uh, have actually been symmetrical. Yeah. And some of them, you know, quite reasonable, six megabits or more, reasonable for a hotel. Uh, it, I just wonder whether there was a trend there to... Not that we've seen. <laughs>